praise band and congregation. Am I going to follow that? I'm going to have to. <laughs> John and I, we've got a little, little running joke that goes on. Every once in a while, he'll hand me a mint. And he said, now, when this mint runs out, he said, put that in your mouth. And when this mint runs out, he says, you can, you can quit your sermon. So he gave me a little chocolate thing today, and it melted before I could put it in my mouth. And so I asked him, I said, does that mean I can't preach today? <laughs> and one day I made the mistake, and I actually put a button in my mouth, and it just never did. <laughs> so anyway, oh, wonderful, wonderful songs and really sermons, sermons put to song today that lead us into and pull us into a worshipful attitude. And it, it doesn't prepare us for worship. It is worship. When we offer up our praise to Almighty God, there's much to be said in Scripture about the importance of singing to God and singing to one another. Through it, we have instruction and theology. We have emotion and reflection, too. We think back and we identify with the grace that has been personally lavished upon each of us. And we express our gratitude and our praise and reality of the relationship that we have with Christ and express that in song. You know, we are in a relationship. Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship. Religion will send you to hell, but a relationship with Christ will assure you your name is written in the book of life, your citizenship is in heaven, and that through from now on and throughout all eternity, we are nurturing that relationship with Jesus Christ. We're doing that even now. We're nurturing that relationship. Mary found herself at the feet of Jesus. Martha was busied about much work and distracted. And as I was looking at this, Luke includes only five verses here. That's the way it's divided up. There's only five verses that introduce us to Mary and Martha. Lazarus is not mentioned. But Luke knows this of this family. Now, he may have never met this family. But he certainly knows about them because who could forget and neglect Lazarus' resurrection? Who could neglect that Jesus would spend so many times and hours with this family in their home during his Passion Week? But Luke includes only five verses. It was my intention to preach in 11 through uh, through 13, verse, verses 1 through 13, but as I look more and more at these five verses, it deserves careful reflection. There's a reason why the Holy Spirit chose to move Luke to include this. And it almost, in a way, stands out from everything else in the gospel, especially in this flow of thought. But then, as I look back, and what Luke is writing and at what Jesus is doing with his disciples and what is recorded, the lawyer asking Jesus a question, Jesus telling the parable of the Good Samaritan or the example of the Good Samaritan. Before that, the disciples had gone out and they were coming back and they rejoiced, were rejoicing that demons were subject to them. And Jesus says, don't rejoice in that. Rejoice in that your names are written in heaven. And then the lawyer says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, how does the law read to you? And uh, the lawyer quotes and says, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with your strength, with your mind, and your neighbors yourself. And Jesus says, do this. You've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But what does that imply? That implies relationship. That implies fellowship. That is relationship with God. Fellowship with God. 
And that relationship with God and that fellowship with God will be demonstrated by the way that you treat others. And then we come as Jesus makes his way to Jerusalem to the home of Martha. Bethany is about two miles away from Jerusalem. Now there's a lot to go in the book of Luke before we get to Jerusalem. And whether Luke is really giving that much attention to the chronology of the journey or to the theme of the journey to Jerusalem. We're going to pick up in verse 38 of Luke chapter 10. And we're going to look at verses 38 through 42. Now as they were traveling along, he entered a village. And as you remember, he sent out disciples to go into the villages where he intended to visit and prepare that village for the coming of the Messiah. They would preach the gospel of the kingdom. They would heal those that were sick. And we already saw the report earlier in this chapter that even demons were subject to them. Miracles were occurring. Signs of the Messiah and the presence of the Messiah were being done. People's hearts were being prepared. And Mary and Martha's heart were prepared. And as they were traveling along, he entered a village that had already been preceded by the disciples. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Now Luke only has five verses concerning this family. John has almost two chapters. All of chapter 11, of course, the raising of Lazarus. And then chapter 12, it mentions Mary anointing the feet of Jesus and spending very costly perfume to anoint his feet and dry his feet with her hair. So there was a very close, loving, intimate relationship that Jesus had with his family. But it may be perhaps that this is here where they first meet. And we're going to see as we look at just these few verses, a common denominator that exists among those that were sent out and even the lawyer that had the question that the relationship matters most. It's not that demons are subject. It's not what we accomplish in life, but who we know, who we trust, who we serve, who we follow, and the relationship that we have to nurture with Almighty God. Notice the emphasis that Jesus puts on having a relationship with Him. He entered the village, and a woman named Martha welcomed Him into her home. Maybe Martha either was a widow or she had a husband. He's not mentioned, but she is the woman of the house. It's her home. It's her house. He welcomed, she welcomed Jesus into her home. Some didn't welcome Jesus, but do you remember that Jesus told his disciples, those that welcome you into, your, into their homes, your peace shall rest upon them. And certainly blessing had come to the home of Mary and Martha. Don't know where Lazarus was at this time. He's not mentioned. And she had a sister called Mary. Who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. Now the disciples were present. And this is another teaching moment for the disciples here. Because they too are hanging on the words of Jesus. And Jesus is preparing them for his departure. And he's preparing not only the twelve, which turn out to be eleven, but he's preparing all of those who will hear, because they are his disciples as well. The disciples number more than just the twelve. There are many disciples by now. And they are hanging on his word in this house. Don't know how large the house was. Don't know how many people were in the house. But Martha and Mary catch Luke's attention. And they're a reason 
just those two ladies are a reason for him to spend this time in instructing us and instructing the disciples. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. I don't know if Jesus, what his posture was. I don't know if he was standing. I don't know if he was seated or even if he was reclining. I know Martha's preparing a meal and they're going to eat very soon. But here Mary is at the very feet of Jesus. Often it was men that would sit at the feet of a rabbi. But here we find Mary. And she was listening to his word. Folks, we're blessed today because we have his word in our hand. You want to listen to Jesus? Read the word of God. He is the law of God in flesh. He is the word of God in flesh. The word was with God. The word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Read the Word of God, you'll learn about Jesus. I was watching a movie the other night, and a lady was, the, the scene was, there was a woman that was sitting in church, and she had lost her daughter, and her sons were going to prison. And she said, I have been coming to this church for 60 years, praying, seeking his guidance, and I haven't heard a word. And I thought to myself, <laughs> you haven't read your Bible. You may not hear the Word of God audibly, but you certainly have the Word of God in your hand. And you have His counsel. You have His wisdom. You have His salvation. You learn of His love. You learn of His mercy, His grace. You learn of His wrath. You learn of His discipline. You get counsel from this word. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. By the word of God, we learn what his commandments are and what he expects of us and how to live the Christian life. We learn of his empowerment. We learn that he has given us his spirit. We learn that he has paid our sin debt in full. We learn that we are in an intimate relationship with Him and a joyful fellowship. We learn that despite of what life's circumstances may deal to us, God is in control. Regardless of the medical report, or Judy Glidden, God bless her, finding her husband dead in bed. Did that capture God by surprise? We learn from his word that it did not. We learn that there will be comfort. There will be encouragement. We also learn that there will be pain in life. Jesus said in this life you will have trouble. You will have tribulation. But we also know that in the midst of that trouble and that tribulation that we can have cheer. Because Judy knows, and she's hurt, she's grieving, understandably so. The Bible never tells us not to grieve. What the Bible does tell us is not to grieve without hope. And Judy grieves with the hope that she is going to see not only Jesus, but she'll see her husband again one day. We know through the Word of God that the separation that we experience... When a loved one passes in Christ, that that separation is temporary and that we will see them again. We learn the peace of God and we learn that we can have peace with God through Jesus Christ. It is that relationship that is of utmost importance for without Him, we can accomplish absolutely nothing. And we must live according to his plan and to his rules. He is not one who puts shackles upon us. His word is not a shackle upon us, but is liberating. 
I didn't know joy and I didn't know peace until I trusted the Christ who died for me. And sweet is his word. Sweet is his counsel. Sweet is his mercy. We learn that our citizenship is in heaven. Our names are written in heaven in the book of life. And we learn that we have his spirit. And we learn also that there is absolutely nothing that's going to separate us from the love of God. And that inspires us to want to serve. Our service is a result of salvation. It is not a means by which we earn salvation. We can be busied about doing things and neglect. And we can be doing good things, but not doing the most important thing. And sometimes we sacrifice the great for the good. The great is, is that what we do, the direction we go, and what we accomplish is based upon God's Word and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit through whom Christ Himself has given us and we accomplish His will. Martha was very distracted. God doesn't want us to be distracted with doing things. Things distract us sometimes. I've been guilty of that, of doing things and serving, but yet neglecting What's most important, and that is my relationship and my fellowship with Jesus Christ. That's what Martha was doing. She was distracted. Mary was not. What do you think the disciples should have gleaned from this experience? Because Jesus wasn't going to be with them for very long. Does that mean that because he was absent from them in body that their relationship was severed? Absolutely not. What God wanted them to know through this instruction with Jesus Christ very at present at Mary and Martha's home is that don't be so distracted with doing things that you neglect your relationship and your fellowship with me. That is the most important thing. Time with him. In prayer, in worship, and your service is birthed from that. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. She was doing good things. She was doing nice things. She was wanting to serve her Lord. She was excited that Jesus had come. And she was doing good things. But she was neglecting the most important thing. She came up to the Lord and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. And I guess Martha was a bit surprised because I think she was probably expecting Jesus to rebuke Mary For not helping Martha. But what Martha gets is a gentle rebuke and instruction from the Lord. Martha was sacrificing the most important thing and supplementing it with a good thing. Nurturing our relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ and immersing ourselves in the Word of God and God's Word immersed in us puts us in right relationship and right fellowship. And then what we do will be an expression of that relationship. How we treat others will be an expression of our relationship and our fellowship with God and what we know of God's word. It was very important to Jesus that his disciples hear this, no doubt, because they are going to be physically separated from their Messiah. You see, they're still learning theology here. Some are hoping that Jesus is going to establish his kingdom right now, and they're going to be a part of it. And they're bewildered at the fact that he's telling them that he's going to be crucified. This is not what they expected. It took time 
for them to understand and to process and to know that their fellowship and their relationship with him, that nothing that they would ever do for him would accomplish anything if they don't first nurture that relationship and fellowship with him. Otherwise, you're going about doing good things, religious things, but not righteous things. You know, uh, folks that are busy are sometimes less concerned about themselves and concerned more about what others are doing or not doing. A fellow that I worked with one time, he said, you know, I don't have a care in the world. I said, well, how do you manage that? He said, well, my wife takes care of my money and my neighbors take care of my business. He said, I, I don't have a thing to worry about. Martha was more worried about Mary's business when Martha should have been worried about Martha's business. I don't want to be too hard on Martha here. Jesus wasn't either. But this is something that we need to learn from this very brief section in Scripture. Martha says, Lord, don't you see? That she's left me to do all these things alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. You know what? You ever remember your parents call you either by your first name more than once or by your full name more than once and you know you're in trouble. They get your attention. Jesus wants Martha's attention. She's so busied, so hurried, and her mind, no doubt, is racing about all of the stuff that she has to get accomplished. Good things, nice things, pleasant things, enjoyable things. But they're not God things. Not at this moment. Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. Martha was doing things in excess. No doubt she was sweating, going about looking for this and that, misplacing this pot or this utensil. She was worried and bothered about so many things. But only one thing, but only one thing is necessary. And that one thing that is necessary, Mary has chosen the good part. Martha was doing nice things, good things, pleasant things, but she wasn't doing, she hadn't chosen the good part. And what did Mary do? What was she doing? What does the text say? She was at the feet of Jesus, listening to his word. This is a message that the disciples desperately needed to hear. Because before long, they could be very busy with the things of ministry. Not bad things. Good things. Godly things. But it's so easy to be busied, to be worried, and to be bothered about so many things. And you get distracted and neglect the most important thing. Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Five verses that speaks volumes to us and calls us because it sits out as if we're almost out of place. These five verses and this flow that, that Luke is writing here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it stands out so much that these five verses deserve some attention and a time to pause and to reflect and to ask ourselves, what am I worried about? What am I bothered about? What am I busying myself with? You know, weddings. It's kind of interesting. I officiated a wedding a, a few months ago, 
and so much time, so much money, so much distance, so many people traveling, buying dresses and tuxedos and shoes, you know, not, not just this wedding, but other weddings too. And I, I, I told the wedding coordinator, I said, you know, the setting is beautiful. It was an Italian villa situated on the mountainside of, of West Texas. An absolutely gorgeous venue for a wedding. And I said, the ceremony itself is less than 10 minutes. I've got to talk slow. I've got to draw this out. And, and I, I, I told the bride and groom, I said, now listen, this is going to be over before you know it. And it's going to seem, it's going to be so brief that it's going to seem irreverent. But all the preparation and all the time, and it was over in 10 minutes. Thankful for the reception that lasted longer, so it made it worth, it made it worth the trip and the worthwhile. But they were married in probably less than 10 minutes. We get busy and we get hurried. And we have goals. And those are not bad things. But when they replace the most important thing, that's when we need to scale back. And we need to hear the Lord speak to our minds and our hearts and maybe call our names more than once. And remember what's important to him is that we be at his feet. That we be listening to his words. Listening to the word of God. What does God's word say? What does he want for my life? When we get busy, when we get bothered, and when we get worried, <laughs> we're not spending enough time at the feet of Jesus. Over the holidays... We're going to be busy about many things. Thanksgiving, Christmas. Busy and hurried about gifts and arranging schedules or rearranging schedules and all of that. Those are not bad things. But we can get so caught up that we don't even reflect upon the reason and upon the person. That's why God gave the Sabbath. Every week, he wanted people to reflect on the relationship that they have with him. And then throughout the year, unleavened bread, Passover, first fruits, Pentecost. Then in the fall, they'd have Feast of Trumpets and then the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur and and then the Feast of Tabernacles or Feast of Booze throughout the year. And every week, God wanted to remind his people that you're in relationship with me. That's a common denominator of these five verses. With this whole section that Luke is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is taking his disciples on a journey and he's preparing them. Because they're going to be busy. They're going to be sometimes running for their lives. Be stoned, beaten, jailed. They're going to be busy doing things. But the most important thing is that they remain at the feet of Jesus. This week, this holiday, this season, spend some time at the feet of Jesus. And spend some time in his word and hear his voice as he speaks to us and gives us direction. Don't be worried. Don't be bothered. Don't be so busy. But spend some time with him. Let's pray. Father, your word is good.
There's absolutely nothing that will return void. And even though these are five verses, these verses shout volumes to us of how important it is to listen to you. We pause and we listen. It's bad. What are you bothered about? What are you worried about? What are you busy with? These are not illegitimate things, not un unimportant things. But be reminded as you sit at the feet of Jesus and hear his word that God has this. He has your circumstances in his hand. Nothing, even though it may have taken you by surprise, will not take him by surprise. He has your past, present, and future in his hand. He is guiding you. He is guarding you. And he wants you at his feet. This is God's beloved son. Listen. He may be saying to you now, trust me as your Savior. I stand with outstretched arms ready to receive you as my child. Trust me. And I will forgive you. I will save you. I will write your name in heaven. I will seat you with my son at my right hand I will give you my spirit I will give you eternal life I will give you a hope an assurance and a relationship that will last all eternity is bad. I'm going to ask you right now if you will receive Jesus as your Savior. Call out to Him, Lord, save me. I believe Jesus died for me. And I want Him as my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me white as snow. And make me your child. It's bad. I'm going to ask you if you called out to him now. Would you slip that hand up and say, Yes. Yes, I trust Christ. If you want to become a member of this church, slip that hand up. Pastor Don will get a card in your hand. Very simple. Father, we love you because you first loved us, gave yourself. Through your precious Son for us on the cross, paid our sin debt in full, gave us the right to be called children of God, and have made us citizens of your kingdom, which we will enjoy and experience throughout all eternity. You're worthy of our service and of our praise and of our humble attention. your holy name through Christ's holy name and the power of your spirit Amen well, As we conclude I want to uh, invite you all I know that uh, many have signed